Hello, welcome back. We are joined with Eddie Acapinti, the Monmouth University football analyst for our ESPN3 broadcast. So thank you so much for joining us today and taking time out of your day. Tony Lynn, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. No, no problem. Mike, you want to start us off? Yeah, what's going on, Eddie? Just first want to ask you, when's the last time you've been on this panel? I think the last time I was up here uh, was a couple years ago. My uh, my broadcast partner, Matt Harmon, has been up here a few times. And the time before that was when I was in your shoes and I was a student back in the day. So uh, I'm happy to be back. Well, got a few questions for you today. And let's start off with none other than Reggie White. Um, we've seen what Reggie White could do with his most explosive performance coming against Fordham, where he caught for 10 catches, 167, and two touchdowns. How does Monmouth look to free him up today in what should be more of a running game? It should be a running game. Uh, I know that both teams obviously want to run the football first. Uh, Reggie White Jr. is a pretty special student athlete. He, he's 6'4", 200 pounds. He's a big rangy athlete. Um, and he runs like a receiver who plays the slot, but he plays on the outside. So the challenge for Kevin Morris, Kevin Callahan, for the quarterbacks today is going to be getting Reggie White in one-on-one -on -one matchups in which he can exploit his athleticism and his size on the outside. There's not a defensive back in the Big South that can guard Reggie White Jr. one-on-one. -on -one. I say that on the radio all the time, and it's true, as you said, with the numbers. It's up to Monmouth, though, to find creative ways to get him the football, not just running one pattern and throwing it to him. Use him in the slot, use him on screens, but take chances, too, and not be afraid to get the ball downfield. Well, now, I mean, going forward, we're going to go to Tony Lynn for, yeah. for a yep. second. So but. now the defense, they've been holding, well, Kennesaw's defense has been holding their opponents to 3.8 yards on a carry and right. have a league low of seven rushing touchdowns that they've let up. So what is your suggestion for Mama to really actually convert and, like, find their wideouts? You know, the, the key is Mama always wants to be balanced mm -hmm. with what they do, and they're never going to abandon the run game or the other way around. They're not going to try to throw the football. And Kennesaw State has been good defensively in watching what they do. It's not anything kind of exotic that they do. They really swarm to the football. They tackle well. Uh, they run a really run-based offense themselves. So they're used to seeing that every day in practice. So when they go out on Saturdays, they're used to doing that. Uh, I think the key for Mammoth is they're bigger than Kennesaw State. Mammoth's offensive line on average, outweighs, outsizes what they're going to see from Kennesaw State. They have to do what they do well. That's run it early on downs, gain good yards. They have to get in uh, second and third and short so you can still run the football because LeVon Chaney, Zach Welch, Ed Royds, the whole crew is having a really good season. If Monmouth gets one-dimensional, if they abandon the run and they just start throwing it all over the field, that's not what they want to do. They're not built for that. And I think they can run it on Kennesaw State, but it's going to be one of those things, Tony Lynn, that they have to stay after. Gotcha. right? If you fail the first two times, don't abandon. You have to continue doing it all game long. And those two- and three-yard runs late in the game can turn into four-, five-, and six-yard runs. Gotcha. Now, Eddie, I know you saw this coming, but it would just be <laughs> impossible to talk about Kennesaw State without talking about that triple option. Uh, it's obvious we're going to see a lot of it today. Uh, could you explain to us a little bit about how it works and more so why it works so well for them? Well, if anyone's going to tune in and, or listen and watch the game or listen to the game today, it's going to sound like a football game in the 1960s with how it's played. Nowadays, everyone spreads you out. They throw it 40, 50 times a game. That's not Kennesaw State's game. They're going to play with three running backs at all times. They're going to literally line up three running backs behind the quarterback, and they're going to run it between 75 and 85% of the time today. It's going to make for a really quick That's game, ridiculous. by the way. So obviously, you know, strap in. The first read is always the fullback. If they can give it to the fullback up the middle, they're going to do that. And it all depends on where Mama's defensive line is playing. If the defensive tackles crash down, they're not going to give it to the fullback. That's option one. Option two is the quarterback keeping it himself. The third and the triple option is pitching it to an outside running back. Now, sometimes the fourth option is throwing it, but they don't do that very often. So it's going to be played. The game is going to be played right in kind of the eight yards around the line of scrimmage. And if Kennesaw has their way, it's going to be three, four people carrying the football all game long. It's really hard to defend because you just don't see it anymore. The thing about the triple option is what Kennesaw wants to do, three yards, three yards, three yards, just keep the ball in their possession. But sometimes on the defensive side, that opens up a big play opportunity. You know, you're trying to go after that quarterback. All of a sudden, you got a guy running around the outside. How does Mama stay intact? Do you attack it? Do you stay back? How do you play this? The, the biggest thing with defending the triple option is, is what's called maintaining disciplined lanes. So if you're the outside linebacker, let's say, for example, and your job is one running back, you cannot cheat over when you think the fullback has the ball. Because if you think he has the ball, 
Odds are he doesn't because that's the deception the offense tries to create. You have to play your assignment football. If your job is fullback, you've got to play the fullback. If your job is quarterback, you got to play the quarterback. The biggest thing also is you have to, and I know it, it sounds weird to say, but everyone has to get hit on that play. If your job is quarterback and he pitches the ball, he's a ball carrier. You have to put your helmet into him. you got to hit him, and you got to get him on the ground. The more you can disrupt the triple option, because there's different moving parts. There's a pitch involved. There's read plays. The more you can make the offense think, the better you can be defensively. I think Mamet's going to come out and try to attack the triple option, and they're going to, instead of waiting to see what happens, they're going to try to force maybe a turnover or two with pitches and with different reads. Tony Lynn? Absolutely. Now, we've been discussing like different keys to the game, but what is your one key to the game for Mamet to be successful? Ooh, that's a good question. I like that. You, you know, Mammoth has in in certain games this year and at certain times been been very good and disciplined. And then at times this year, they've been very undisciplined and they've commit a lot of penalties and they've commit unforced errors. I think the biggest key for this Mammoth team today is to not beat themselves. If they go out, play their game, don't commit penalties, don't commit turnovers, and literally just play their game to the best of their abilities, they're a better team than Kennesaw State. They should win. But it's when they commit penalties. It's when they force or it's when they give the other team the ball and they give turnovers up that they've gotten into trouble this season. When this team plays free and easy and comfortable, they're very good. And we've seen them beating Ford and beating Lehigh earlier in the year. I think if Monmouth doesn't beat themselves, they should be successful today. Absolutely. Mike, uh, Eddie, always good to have you. Love when you bring the stats. Um, Going to take a step back, though, give you a little break. I know you got a game to call today. Um, today's the last game played on Castor Field as it yeah. stands today. So. Is there a game in particular that you always remember from here, possibly the Fordham game this year, or I tend to think that you have a little bit uh, of a backstory. Well, well, I've been watching games at, at Kessler Field, now Monmouth Stadium, since 2002, which was my freshman year, and I've been calling games, first on WMCX and Hawk TV here back in 03. and I'm going to bring you back to 2004, which what grade, what grade were you in in 2004, by the way? I was nine years old. There it uh, is. Whatever that is. <laughs> so when you were nine, and I was a sophomore, uh, Monmouth won a conference championship. And that year they won three games on the last play of the game. Uh, the game that sticks out in my mind above all else was the homecoming game that year. It wasn't a nice day like this. It was rainy and it was cold. And it was 9-6. to six. Monmouth defeated Central Connecticut State 9-6 on a field goal. And you say 9-6, you go, that's not very exciting. But it was just the way that Monmouth played. They had such a gritty defensive effort. It was a group that wasn't. And I'll catch flack for this, but they weren't as talented as the players we'll see today. But they were together, and they were very, very just united. And they had a big win. They ended up winning a conference championship that year. Um, and that one, probably more than anyone else, stands out in my mind. Well, Eddie, it seems like you might miss the memories, but I don't think you'll miss the one set of bleachers here at Kessler. <laughs> no, I, you know what? It's a great facility, but we're uh, looking forward to the new facility. I'll put it that Absolutely. way. And being an alum, so you're not just our typical alum that only comes back on homecoming. You're here all the time. So right. how is this to see, like, a lot of people that you knew throughout the years just come back and be able to see everyone? You know, it's great. You know, the parking lot's full right now, and it's full with current students, with recent grads, with, with all the way back. And, and it's great to have everyone come back. You know, selfishly, I'd love to see this every Saturday. But it's great to have all of my friends back, all my former WMCX Hawk TV alums that I went to school with come back and uh, it's great that you guys continue this tradition as well absolutely thank you so much for joining oh us. it's my Bye. pleasure Thanks, thank Eddie. you guys oh, it's thank you a pleasure having you